Thanks, Rabbi Dan, and Shabbat Shalom to all of you out there. So yesterday, I was uh, finally released out of my travel quarantine, and uh, I made my <clears throat> excuse me, my first superstore run, which felt strangely comforting. It was, I, I admit, disorienting to learn all of the new protocols now for proper shopping cart sanitation and queuing up for tills. I also made my own mask out of a bandana, which uh, sort of felt like a bank robbery, but was much more innocent than that. But really, after all of this time restricted to our house, it was nice to see the outside world still functioning. And I also stopped by the shul to pick up a few things from my office. I walked into the sanctuary and felt comforted by returning to that holy space that is more than just this backdrop to my Zoom screen. But I went into the sanctuary not just for my own spiritual needs, it was also there to help with an important delivery. On my way home, I delivered a Torah. Next week, on the first day of Pesach, our woman will be called to the Torah as a bat mitzvah. She and her family have been planning for so long. Layla will participate just as we have this morning via Zoom, but she will read from that Sefer Torah from her house. As I was driving from the shul to Layla's house, I was having a phone conversation with her mother, Alyssa. It was wonderful, and we spoke about the strangeness and the significance of delivering a Torah to a person's house. We talked about how it was such a Jewish response to a crisis that we adapt and we always take Torah with us. Jewish history is full of examples of how we have made decisions that completely changed the paradigms by which we practice Judaism, but have in the end allowed us to survive and flourish. In the days of Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai escaping from a besieged Jerusalem to establish a rabbinic study-based Judaism, after the destruction of the temple, to the emancipation of Jews into broader society in the 18th century that brought about so many of the progressive changes in Jewish practice that we cherish today. Judaism has changed and adapted whenever we needed it to. Today, in the, our real efforts to continue to practice Judaism, within the context of a pandemic, we are also adapting. We are delivering a Torah scroll to the home of a bat mitzvah. We are using Zoom and streaming our services like right now to bring so many of us together inside our homes. We are planning those Pesach seders, as Rabbi Dan mentioned, with friends and relatives via FaceTime and Zoom so that we don't have to be alone. Yesterday, I read an op-ed in the New York Times called, I never used my computer on the Sabbath until the coronavirus. It was written by a conservative colleague, Rabbi Avi Olitsky, who is a rabbi in Minneapolis. This is what he wrote. Had you asked me a year ago whether logging onto my computer and participating in Saturday morning service would be breaking Shabbat, I would have answered yes. But I found that doing so not only enhanced my Shabbat, it made my Shabbat. It continues a bit later, to truly experience the restorative force of Shabbat, <clears throat> one needs this pausing <clears throat> to happen within community. Shabbat may be the gift God keeps in store for Israel, as described by the Talmud, but the way to truly delight in it is with other people. Before the pandemic, community on Shabbat centered around synagogue. Some people have relationships that exist only within the walls of their synagogue, friends for decades sitting near or next to each other because of Shabbat at synagogue. 
The pandemic took that physical community away from us, but because of technology, once a distractor and now a savior, we are able to immerse in community despite our physical isolation. As Jillian mentioned, the Shabbat is known as Shabbat HaGadol. And we are instructed to begin in earnest our preparations for Pesach. For some of us, Pesach has been on the forefront of our minds as we consider how to observe the holiday in such unusual circumstances. For others, the approach of the holiday has only begun to register, if at all, because there is just so much to think about. It can feel overwhelming. I would suggest, however, that the most important thing for us to do as we get ready for Pesach is to follow the example of the delivery of the Torah scroll. We adapt and we hold tight at the very same time. We will adapt in ways we never would have considered last year. We will gather only with the people living with us at our Seder tables. For some of us who live alone, this will be particularly difficult. But know that you are not alone, as we will connect in a large web together with fellow Jews around the world, whether by phone, video conferencing, or other platforms. The email that Rabbi Dan mentioned yesterday gives so many resources for how to conduct an online Seder. I've heard that uh, this year a Seder is being called a Zader, a Zoom Seder. If you have any questions about how to do this, how to connect, we're happy to talk to you. We hope that you'll join us on the second night of Pesach and feel that sense of connection. It's interesting that these adaptations for Pesach are happening beyond the progressive movements in Judaism. Some of you may have heard last week of the Sephardi rabbis of Israel giving permission to turn Zoom on before the Chag, before the holiday begins, to allow socially isolated people to remain connected to their families. Just this past Thursday, there was an article from Mishpacha magazine, which is the major online publication of the Orthodox world that was making the rounds on Jewish social media. There, Rabbi Moshe Tuvia Leif of Brooklyn made this statement. Sell even chametz gamur or things you would not normally sell. Now you're going to be machmir on pikuach nefesh. I'll translate that. Sell chametz gamur. Chametz gamur is the chametz, those items that are forbidden to eat on Pesach, that are really super duper chametzi, like a loaf of bread or a box of spaghetti. In general, when we clean our houses for Pesach, we get rid of those things, make sure that they are completely removed from our homes. Then, as a special extra assurance for whatever traces of chametz might be left in our home, the ancient rabbis came up with a special failsafe. Sell it. Any chametz that remains in our possession, we sell to someone who's not Jewish. That way, even if it exists in physical sense in your home, it's not really yours since you don't own it. So when Rabbi Leif said, sell the chametz gamur, this was a major heter, a ruling of leniency that he was granting his congregation. Don't worry about getting rid of all of your chametz. This is not a time to be throwing away food. Don't worry about the extra burdens of clearing out everything in your house. We have enough to worry about right now that we don't need to add extra layers of anxiety. Sell the obvious traces, the obvious chametz, just like the traces. Judaism, with its millennia old innovations, gives us a system by which we can adapt. 
Now the opposite of a heter, of that leniency, is a chumra, a stringency. The second part of Rabbi Leif's statement is the reason behind all of these adaptations. He said again, now you are going to be machmir about pikuach nefesh, which is to say, we are going to obligate you with a chumra, a stringency, because of the obligation to save lives. In Judaism, the obligation of pikuach nefesh, of saving a life, rises above nearly every other mitzvah without question. Violating Shabbat or a holiday has always been acceptable in the name of saving a life, even if the danger was not imminent. All the more so if the number of lives we can save staying home. I want to go back to the delivery of the Torah scroll to Layla's house. Even with the great adaptations that we have made, we have only survived because we have continued to carry the Torah with us. Even when we adapt, when we need to find new ways of expressing our Judaism, we find the way to make sure that Torah is still at the center. I know there can be a natural temptation to say, I can't even deal with the Seder this year. But I want to encourage you to still find a way to make a Seder. It doesn't have to be a beautiful Seder. Simple is just fine. If you can't find all of the items for your Seder plate, be creative, adapt. In the email that we sent you yesterday, there are many suggestions for alternative symbols that you can use. And if you are hosting a Zoom Seder, reach out to people you know who are living alone and invite them to join you. If you are willing to include other members of our shul in your Seder, please let me or Rabbi Dan know so that we can make sure that people don't feel alone. Having a Seder is what our people have done for thousands of years, sometimes in situations far more precarious and dangerous than our own. If you have children in your home, please all the more so, be sure to sit for a Seder. There can be no clear expression of our Jewish identity than to show by example that even in the most difficult of times, we sit together to have this special meal. That the message of freedom and redemption are so intrinsic to who we are that we would never miss the opportunity to tell this story that experience will be imprinted upon them for their entire lives. Today, we are living through a time for which Judaism has prepared us well by offering a model for adaptation and strength. I wish all of you a meaningful Pesach. May it remind us of the redemption that we remember from the story of our ancestors, that it's possible in our time as well. Shabbat Shalom and Hag Sameach. Yesha Koch, Rabbi Brown, and Hag Sameach as well. Beautiful, beautiful drosh. Thank you. Our service continues.